for that. It's a big relief for us. Thank you for your prayers for that. So today's sermon, God's shock at our fickleness. Warnings of waning oneness. Our big idea today is this. To whet your passion for God, recall how peerless he's been. How peerless, how there's no comparison. We just sang, nothing compares to the promise I have in you. We're continuing our exploration of the Bible's longest book, Jeremiah. In the second chapter, we get into some specifics of what the spiritually dangerous drift the Israelites of the southern kingdom of Judah were caught in. Yes, there had been some somewhat superficial reforms under kings Hezekiah and Josiah, but the undercurrent of idolatry was still there. Although the temple had been repaired, pagan worship at the high places and under the larger spreading trees still continued. It was a distinctly downward drift, accelerated by the godless leadership of some wicked kings, such as Manasseh and corrupt priests and prophets. Hmm. Is there a similar drift in our day? Many churches have been noticing attendances not near pre-pandemic levels, and that's not accounted for merely by online streaming of services. In the past couple of weeks, Carrie Newhoff featured John Eldridge, who you might recall from Wild at Heart, on his podcast. Eldridge maintains the pandemic has caused significant trauma for people. It makes it hard to get back to normal as in the way we were pre-pandemic. In fact, Eldridge wonders if what we're witnessing spiritually is connected to what Jesus predicted around the end times. In his remarkable Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus predicted, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands to the firm will be saved, firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Is this love of most growing cold, what we're witnessing? People seem to be less interested in attending church and more intent on recreation, picking up other pursuits, devoting their attention to other things than worship and Bible study and fellowship. John Eldridge has been struck by this attack on faith. In his book, Resilient, he writes, the perfect storm has converged over the human heart. He elaborates in the podcast transcript. He said, over the last eight months, I've received more texts and emails from friends, mature people who are giving up on faith. They're giving up on God. And I think this is the vulnerable moment. So we've talked all about first there was the modern life, which was just insane in itself, and then the pandemic rolls through and clobbers everybody. Now we're in this deeply, deeply depleted condition, and the enemy of our soul sees an opportunity to cause a sweeping loss of faith in the world. Paul warns about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, look, before the climax of this whole thing, there's going to be a great falling away. And it's not thousands of people marching the streets with placards, I hate Jesus. It's not that. It is heartache. In your depleted condition, some heartache enters in. Infertility. The company collapses. Betrayed by a friend. An affair by a spouse. Heartache enters in. And in that moment, the enemy pounces to urge us to give up on God. You see, he's not good. He's not for you. He's not with you. And I'm reading texts from people who have walked with God for 40 years saying, I think I'm done. I just don't think I can hang in there anymore. It's too disappointing. He doesn't seem to be coming through. And what they don't understand is that in their vulnerable condition, the enemy of their souls has swept in to cloud and poison their relationship with God. End quote from John Eldridge. Is Eldridge reading your mail? Can you relate to that? 
painful circumstances can insert a wedge between us and the Lord? Is your faith hanging on by a thread? Are you just in the spiritual doldrums, a, a desert of dryness where once there was excitement, you really felt God loved you? In today's passage, Jeremiah diagnoses the spiritual depletion of his countrymen and provides some clues to help us not fall away, how to keep our love for the Lord simmering rather than let it grow cold. Next section, the puzzled, jilted partner. God has a complaint to bring against the people of Judah. He's been treated so unfairly, it's as if he has a legal case to present where the injustice would be recognized in a court of law. It's a legitimate beef. Jeremiah 2.9, Therefore I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. What are the charges? that they have turned their backs on him, even though he did nothing to deserve it. In fact, he had been a faithful partner to them all along. Nevertheless, he's been jilted. They've abandoned him for other gods. His faithfulness to them can be seen in at least four aspects, patronage, protection, provision, and possession. Patronage. He's been their patron the way a medieval artist survived by having a wealthy person sort of adopt them, underwrite their living expenses in exchange for creating works of art that adorned their homes and their chapels. The wealthy person was the artist's sponsor. It was a close arrangement that benefited both parties. Verses 2 to 3. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. You know, the significant attachment suggested in those words, devotion, bride, love, followed, holy to the Lord. To be holy here means to be set apart to him and his service. NIV Study Bible comments that the Hebrew word for devotion refers to the most intimate degree of loyalty, love, and faithfulness that can exist between two people or between an individual and the Lord. There's a real bond here. God had undertaken to rescue this particular people out of slavery in Egypt. Protection, verse 3. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Picture Pharaoh's army and chariots chasing them down into the Red Sea, then washing up on shore, dead. Remember the destruction of Og, king of Bashan, and Sion, king of the Amorites, and their territories when they refused to let Israel pass through their land unmolested. God protected them from their enemies. Provision. It's estimated there may have been about two and a half million refugees from Egypt when you include the women and children amongst the Israelites. How would you even begin to manage to sustain such a crowd for 40 years wandering through desert wastelands? But the Lord led them to water, miraculously at times breaking rocks open and sent manna day by day so they were all fed. This is reflected in verse 6. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? Possession. God brought them into the promised land, one they could call their own as he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. Jeremiah 2.7 I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. New Living Translation for inheritance has the possession I had promised you. It started out as a good land flowing with milk and honey. But as they dined on its richness, they forgot God and started taking it for granted, defiling it instead with their handmade idols and immoral rituals. They did not observe Sabbath years, so the land did not get its follow rest, but was mined and depleted. So in all these ways, patronage, protection, provision, possession, 
God has upheld his end of the bargain, the covenant, but Israel has not. So he has a legitimate charge to bring against them for breach of covenant. He's puzzled, like a partner who's acted faithfully all along but been inexplicably dumped. The charge is summed up in the rhetorical question at the start of verse 5. This is what the Lord says, What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? What fault indeed? Next section, mutiny from the bounty. Despite all this bounty that Yahweh has provided, the Israelites have rebelled against him. They've committed mutiny, ousting him from leadership in favor of the Baals and other fertility gods popular in neighboring lands. And it wasn't just the lower classes, the, the uneducated commoners who didn't know any better. The Lord blames the leaders, religious and civil, who knew exactly what they were doing, how treasonous they were being. Verse 8. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Priests and prophets, the spiritual leaders who were familiar with holy writ, but nevertheless allowed occult and idolatrous worship to be introduced and even promoted. Lawyers and leaders, civil authorities, those who deal with the law, did not know God. Not just knowledge about him, but walking with him intimately. Leaders rebelled against him. Rulers turned against him. They sought alliances from the big power brokers in the region, Assyria to the north or Egypt to the south. About 732 BC, King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, his overlord, sort of. He sent instructions back to the priest at Jerusalem for a new altar he wanted built based on a design he had seen in Damascus. The original altar in David Solomon's temple was shunted aside in favor of this new pagan innovation. So God's word and design was ignored and outright replaced with human invention. Later in the chapter, persecution of true prophets is mentioned. 2.30 In vain I punished your people. They did not respond to correction. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a ravening lion. As a nation, Judah had strayed far from God. Prosperity at first dulled their sense of dependence on him. New worship fads crept in, incorporating fertility rites and prostitution. And finally, the animosity towards Yahweh became active, involving persecution of faithful followers. They had mutinied despite the bounty. But why? How had God so disappointed them as to warrant such rejection? Remember our big idea for today, to whet your passion for God, recall how peerless he's been. Can we say that together? To whet your passion for God, recall how peerless he's been. The passion of Judean priests and leaders had waned because they forgot how faithful he had been in his covenant with them, and instead they became infatuated with other gods. Next section, trading in trash. What? do you want to become? A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Actually, C.S. Lewis kind of took that thought to task and said, actually, what God thinks about us is the most important thing, but we'll put that aside. Tozer was getting at your vision, your image of God is what's really kind of holding you together, what's important about you. Worship is key to life. Worship has to do with our fundamental value system, what we ascribe worth to, hence the word worship. Repeatedly, the Bible emphasizes that, in a sense, we become what we worship. Society offers several options that entice us, such as power, sex, money. These appeal to very basic drives in the human makeup at a, a kind of primal or unconscious level. 
that little ding of a messenger notification or a like on Facebook from one of our favorite friends can become addictive. But God's word warns us that such idols would lead us astray, cause us to become sidetracked from his best goal for us. To become addicted to lesser lords is to allow ourselves to become fit for the trash heap. So our passions are worth protecting. Highlight 5b. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Compare 2 Kings 17, 15. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do, and they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. One more. Just put alongside that Psalm 115, 8, describing the silver and gold hand-fashioned idols of the nations. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. What are you worshiping? What are you becoming? Is that what you really want to become? Why do the lives of so many celebrities end up tragic, full of brokenness, even suicidal? Why do lottery winners find their worries and problems multiply by having excess money? Why does a Canadian government website plainly admit Canada is facing a national opioid overdose crisis that continues to have devastating impacts on communities and families? The Lord wants to spare us from becoming worthless like the idols many chase after and serve. He would have us recognize he is the source of fullness of life. Jeremiah 2.13 my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The cracks in our cisterns drain the life out of us. Tap into him, the fountain of living water, New Living Translation puts it. God expresses his puzzlement at Judah for rejecting him. It's not like any other nation to reject its own gods. Verses 10 to 11. Cross over the coasts of Kittim and look. Send a Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they're not gods at all. Kittim would be around Cyprus over in the west in the Mediterranean. Kedar would refer to the Bedouin tribes of northern Arabia in the east. So God's saying from west to to east, you won't find this happening anywhere. But then he adds a clue that points us in a preventive direction. Verse 11. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. He didn't say exchange their God, but exchange their glory. Do we glory in our God? Do we exult in him, boast about how great and good he is? Do we appreciate and prize him or ignore him, downplay what he's done for us? Verse 13 says they have forsaken or abandoned God. Later in 2.19, consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Do we hold God in awe? Or is he nothing all that spectacular to us? Don't exchange your glory for worthless idols. It's a bad deal. When we treasure God more, when we, we realize how glorious he is, how superior and excellent compared to rival idols, will be less tempted to swap them for junk. Think back to how God rehearsed all he'd done for the Israelites and translate that into Christian equivalence. Patronage. When we've received forgiveness by trusting in Christ, God becomes our Heavenly Father. The cross demonstrates his love and boundless commitment to us. Romans 5.8 We are holy to the Lord, sanctified, set apart as his people, first fruits of a global harvest. 
linen team are heading to Peru to continue that harvest this week. James 1.18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Protection. The Lord brought disaster on Israel's enemies. What about us? 2 Thessalonians 3.3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Provision. God provided manna in the wilderness. What about our needs? Philippians 4.19, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Possession. God's old covenant with Israel involved residency in a geographical location. His new covenant involves his Holy Spirit taking up residence in our lives. Jesus promised in John 14, Now I'll ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him, make our home with him. We become God's possession, God's dwelling place. When we stop and reflect on all the ways God has blessed us to this point, what he's done for us in Christ, the character of being that he's proven himself to be through centuries of Israel's and the church's experience, we come to appreciate and treasure God more for who he is. We'll be less tempted to jettison him in favor of lesser substitutes. Our big idea again, to whet your passion for God, recall how peerless he's been. Last section, resisting the enemy. Earlier I referred to the Kerry Newhoff podcast hosting John Eldridge. I'll close with an example this season Christian gives of how he battled the temptation to forget God and yield to despair in the face of discouraging circumstances. Eldridge refers to an event the previous year and says, there were a couple of things that I thought God had promised Stacy and I that not only did not come true, the opposite happened. And one of them was a real heartbreak in a relationship with one of our children. And that alone happens to every human being. We all experience heartache, okay? Everyone has disappointments, chronic disappointment in their life. But in that moment, this cloud of darkness rolled over me. For several weeks, I would wake up in the morning and wonder, am I a believer anymore? Because I had lost what is for me my normal intimacy with God. And thankfully, I've lived in this work long enough to know exactly what was happening. I began to pray, to reject the presence of the enemy in my life. I reject you. I make no agreements with you. I disavow you. I choose God. And over time, the cloud began to clear, and all I was left with was my heartache. The heartache is real. The heartache remains. The cloud does not need to be there. But as James urges us, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. This stuff doesn't go away with wishful thinking. It is in the name of Jesus. No, no, I'm not cooperating with this. I make no alignment with it. I don't welcome it. I banish it. And as I began to share this, so we put this on our podcast, I told this story in a longer form more openly. And thousands of people have reached out to us to say, me too, end quote. Eldridge made a conscious decision to choose God instead of the lie. He stood firm in the name of Jesus, and though the heartache remained, the cloud lifted. He refused to exchange his glory for an idol. He clung to his passion for God. And once again, the Lord proved how peerless he is. Let's pray. Holy and precious God, how awesome has been your care for us, your commitment to us, your carrying us all this way and on to heaven itself. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we faltered and doubted you or given space to the devil or other idols in our lives. 
we see now in the illumination of your dazzling glory just how worthless and dangerous those are. Show us how to daily tap into you, the fountain of living water, to be refreshed and sustained, first fruits of your harvest. In Jesus' name.